Good morning, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Have any of you ever seen a miracle? When I was little, I'd always ask God, just show me a sign and I'll believe. If you would just prove somehow through some act or some miracle, then I'll, I will place my trust and I'll believe in you. And thanks to God's grace, I never think I saw a miracle in that way, but still I came to faith and realized that I was a sinner in need of God's love and need of Christ as a savior. But even when you look through the story of the Bible, both Old Testament and New, there are stories of people that always ask for signs and wonders. And even when God answered and displayed his power through signs and wonders, still people chose not to believe. There were good occurrences, such as when Gideon asked for God to make this fleece dry in the morning and the ground all around it wet. And then God did that. But then he also asked, well, do it in reverse then the next morning, make the fleece wet and all, and make the fleece dry and then all the ground around it wet. And, and God did that too. But there are also times when the Israelites, right, they are asking for signs and wonders and even e and in Egypt with Pharaoh, he saw the 10 plagues, he saw God's amazing work. And yet still he had a hardened heart. And you fast forward to the New Testament where God came down in the form of a man, walked amongst them, lived a perfect life, performed amazing miracles. He healed people. He cast out demons. He walked on water, displayed all these amazing things. And yet people still chose not to believe that he was the son of God. As obvious and as amazing a proclamation that Christ himself, God himself did these things. Still, people chose not to believe. And so when it came down to it, it really wasn't about people seeing signs. It's not about if God would just show me something, then I'll believe. It com comes down to faith. Believing without seeing. And there's a passage in Hebrews 2 that I'd like to read to you all to encourage you. So if you would please stand as I read God's word. This is from Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. And it says this. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And so nowadays, there are still people that ask God to perform miracles or signs and wonders. And we do believe that God is active and he can do those things. But really, all it should take is for us to look at the cross. When Jesus rose from the grave, that was enough that Jesus demonstrated he truly is God himself, power over death. And that as his sons and daughters, the true miracles that we're forgiven, that we can have new life, that we're no longer chained to our old ways because Christ lives. And so this morning, as we sing these songs, as we hear from God's word, when we find our identity in him, realizing that truly we have been blessed, truly the miraculous has been done because God would send his son to die for us sinners. And so let's open this time in prayer and worship together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can call you our Heavenly Father, that we have an intimate relationship with you, that you are active in our lives. You've answered prayers. We've seen your blessings. And so help us to share that with, with our loved ones, who, especially those who don't know you. We pray that we would open our eyes and bear witness to all the ways that you're working. And we pray that we would open our hearts and recognize all the invisible ways that you've changed our thoughts the ways that you have helped us to live for you, where you've given us peace where none existed before. We thank you so much that through Christ, truly the miraculous has been done. And so we ask that we would recognize the power of the cross, Christ risen from the grave, and that we are forgiven. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
hands feel the pride and joy he gives by grace.
I will be still, know you are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are King over the fire. I will be still, know you are God. I will be still, know you are God. Amen. You may all be seated. Pastor Steve. This morning we will be looking at the 8th chapter of Luke, so if you don't mind turning there, we're going to have a lot of ground to cover. Speaking of coverage, we hate bad coverage. We, uh, we're always kind of looking around to see if we got enough Wi-Fi signal, if we have enough bandwidth, and so we're, uh, we're, always, we're always looking for good coverage because we hate bad coverage. We're looking at those maps. I, oh, do we have enough Wi-Fi coverage? And where's the outages? Where are the electrical power outages? Where are the Wi-Fi outages? Those things just bug us. Or if you're in sales, you 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 see a section that's not covered by your sales team, and and you want maximum coverage. Or in uh, football, you want a defense that can cover a really good wide receivers. And so we hate bad coverage, but we love good coverage. We love good coverage. In baseball, a five-tool player is one who can hit for power, hit for average, throw, uh, throw strong, field defensively, and run like the wind. Uh, we saw this guy, when we were in Cincinnati, we saw this guy, Dela Cruz, uh, hit for the cycle. It was, it was awesome. So now I'm seeing a grand slam, no hitter, and a cycle. And a triple play. But, it's, uh, but we, we love good coverage. Or in acting, we call it a triple threat. A triple threat is one who can sing, dance, and act. Well, we were amazed at our kids' uh, high school, just how many triple threats that school just pr produced when we go watch their school musicals. It was, uh, it was just pretty amazing. I mean, there's good singers, there's good actors, there's good dancers, but do all three well. Now that's coverage. What we're going to talk about today through the four miracles of Jesus is to demonstrate that his coverage is maximum and total. Jesus has total coverage. When he stills the storm, he proves that he has mastery over the natural realm. The supernatural miracles are not inconceivable if we believe in a creator God who created the universe supernaturally. What is made is natural, but he who created has the power, and he has power over the natural realm. We'll talk about Jesus and the demoniac who had several demons in him. As he delivered that individual, we see that God has power over the spiritual realm. So not just the natural realm, but the spiritual realm. He has got it covered. After all, does Colossians 1 not tell us, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he's got control, visible, invisible, heaven and earth. I mean, everything in nature, including time, space, and matter, is under his lordship. Land, sky, and sea is under his lordship. From the celestial to the subatomic is under his lordship. He has lordship over the natural and the spiritual. Also the physical health. And life and death, as we shall see. And so when we are confident in the fact that Jesus has got it covered, 
that Jesus is in control. Then to throw on to the fact that he cares. Because what we're going to see in each of these miracles are statements about what he really cares about in his relationship with us. So that when we're struggling with whatever area, whether it's mental health, he's got that covered. Whether it's your physical health, he's the great physician. Whether it's spiritual struggles, you're just having struggles caring or believing or understanding, whatever spiritual struggle or physical or or mental struggle, he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the Savior of all those who put their faith in him. And so let's take a look at the coverage that Jesus has. He demonstrates this in the natural realm as they were out on a boat with the disciples. They travel from the uh, Sea of, they're traveling on the Sea of Galilee. So it says uh, in verse 22, one day he got into the boat with his disciples and he said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were, the boat was filling up with water, and they were in danger. And they went, and they woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was calm. Now, Jesus was asleep, and a circumstance arose. The winds and the waves were wild. Why did it not bother Jesus? Because Jesus knows. He's got those under control. So he could sleep. It's not like he was having narcoleptic problems. Like, you know, I, I was able to sleep on the roller coaster, uh, uh, the, the one at Disneyland, the, 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 the big mountain railroad. You know, ask my family. I, I, I could sleep on Small World. I could sleep in the Lincoln. And that's a good nap place for parents and kids. And try Thunder Mountain Railroad. It, it, it works. But, 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 uh, but, but here, it was worse than Thunder Mountain Railroad. And there was this great, great commotion. And so they woke Jesus up. And Jesus woke up. And he stood up. And, uh, uh, and he, he, he basically stood up, calmed the sea, calmed the wind. But notice what he says. He says to them, where is your faith? Right? That's his big concern. It wasn't about the circumstance. And for us, we can be so overwhelmed by circumstances, we take our eyes off Christ. That's what happened when Peter started walking on the water. He had his eyes on Christ. He took his eyes off Christ, and he started looking. Wait, I'm walking on water. What is this? And then he sunk because he put his eyes on the circumstance instead of on the Christ. And if we are putting our worries about this next fall of school or on obtaining a job or on a relationship that's falling apart or the economy putting your job at risk or someone dying from a terminal illness in our family and we only focus on the circumstance and not christ jesus is entitled to ask where is your faith he calms a storm but the point is, where is your faith? Because the Lord of nature cares about our commitment to faith over fear. There was great fear. But he was trying to teach him a lesson through all of this. That if you put your trust in the Lord who has control and mastery over nature, you don't need to fear the circumstance. The second miracle is the miracle of the demoniac who had lots of demons in him. Verse 22. One day, oh, no, wait, not 22. Verse 26. One day uh, they, they sailed to the country of the, uh, the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. All right, so they're in the Sea of Galilee, they go from one side to the other. They now travel to the Gentile side of Galilee. It's Gentile because the Jews wouldn't have pig farms. 
They wouldn't have a pig ranch because they hated pigs. They didn't like the look of pigs, the smell of pigs, the taste of pigs, because they've never had our spirits. No. After Acts chapter 9 and 10, things will, would change for them, but this was a forbidden food for, for the Jews in the Old Testament time. So, so the garrison, we know, was a Gentile area. And so when he stepped out onto land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he wore no clothes. He had not lived in a house, but he lived among the tombs. All right, so, I mean, that would give you a grave concern. So here he is living among the tombs. He has been described as being one who was so strong he would break the bonds uh, of the chains that tried to restrain him. He, he, was, uh, he was controlled and he was empowered by demons. And yet, he, though the man never saw Jesus or met Jesus, the demons recognize exactly who Jesus is. Do you know the difference between most humans and demons? This might alarm you. Demons believe and fear God, and a lot of humans don't. Demons know, even though they rebelled, they know who Christ is, and they know who the real authority is. And a lot of times when we think about demons, we're thinking of all these scary movies because the movies have given more power to the demons than they have to Christ. Christ is more powerful than the demons. And in the only couple of situations that I've ever been involved with, someone that had demons in them, I saw how they cower at the name of Christ, because Christ has all power over them. So it says in verse 28, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. So the demon knew exactly who Jesus is. He knew that Jesus is the son of the most high God. He feared because he said, don't torment me, because he knows the power that Jesus has. And then it says, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, because Jesus has that authority. For many a time it had seized him when he was under guard and bound with chains and shackles. He would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So uh, times passed, the demon would just come and he would have these uh, amazing strength. There was, uh, this, this incident is recorded in all three synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are, are the ones that are very similar, Matthew, Mark, Luke. John's pretty distinct. And so the synoptic gospels, which, which really focus on the, uh, on the humanness of Christ, where John focuses on the deity of Christ, uh, they all contain this particular story. Well, they all focus on his deity, but you know, they tell more about the story of his life and in, in, uh, in, in more of that sequence. But Kurt Koch in his book, Occult Bondage and Deliverance, marks from Mark chapter 5, these characteristics of somebody who is possessed by a demon. Indwelling of an unclean spirit, unusual physical strength, because he broke those chains, paroxysms or fits of rage. He couldn't be tamed, Mark says. He was just, he was just wild and, and all of that. There was a disintegration or splitting of the personality where he would worship Jesus and then later turning on Jesus. There was a resistance to spiritual things. There's a hyperesthesia or extensive sensibility uh, where he knew Jesus immediately without former contact. There's an alteration of voice because there were many demons that were occupying and controlling this individual. So we see in verse 30, Jesus then asked him, what is your name? What is your name? And he said, legion. For many demons had entered him. So I want you to understand, demons are not just negative energy. It is not some kind of ghost. It is not the dark side of the yin and the yang. It is a person. Demons are persons. Demons are angelic beings that fell with Lucifer. 
who rejected God and God's authority, and they are they they're evil angels, basically, is what demons are. They have names. Jesus asked, What is your name? Now it's interesting because the demon says, Legion, for many demons had entered him. We don't know how many demons were there, but a legion of soldiers and the Roman army was 6,000 soldiers. All right, so a legion, 6,000, these 6,000 demons would end up in a couple of thousand pigs. But it's important to note that 6,000 demons, if that was the number, couldn't even overpower Jesus. Jesus got more power than them. So they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. And so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pig, and the herd rushed down the steep banks into the lake and drowned. I, I know that's quite a sight, uh, quite of an imagination, which is why I thought a lighthearted picture might be better than anything else. But the, the point is, Jesus is able to direct them because he has all, all authority. He could have sent them to the abyss, but he sent them into pigs, sent them over the cliff because uh, they were occupying something. And Jesus has all power to do that, as he will one day say, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angel. I remember a, a young lady who sold her soul to the devil, San Francisco State student. And I was asked by uh, a pastor who was dealing with her he asked a bunch of pastors to come and just to pray and i was like mid-20s and i said no thank you uh, you know but he just kept begging he said just come to pray that's, that's you don't do anything just pray no thank you uh, but you know i just felt okay i need to go there just to pray you know? and, and uh, be there with my friend but I, I remember there were several demons that were just in her and were coming out of her and that was uh, it, it, what was just amazing was to see how powerful Christ is over the, the demonic. So he's got the natural realm covered. He's got the spiritual realm covered. We are more than conquerors through Christ, Romans 8. We have victory through Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. We are triumph in Christ. We have overcome the evil one through Christ, 1 John 2. He, greater is he than, that is in us than he that is in the world. That the first day the devil, 1 John 4, 4. 1 John 5, 18, we are untouched by the evil one because of Christ. And so this is our, our hope when it comes to the area of the spiritual. And maybe you're struggling spiritually, maybe not with a demon, but with apathy, with lack of faith, with, with some spiritual issue. I want you to know you can trust the Lord Jesus. Now, what's interesting is after this deliverance is what he, what he addresses to them. Because we, we see that the herdsmen who lost the pigs said, uh, where are we gonna get pepperoni for our pizza? Don't worry, it's not gonna affect the pepperoni we're gonna have on our pizza today for our membership meeting. It's not those pigs. Okay. Uh, no, but anyway, uh, he's, he, he, he said um, they, they fed and he told it, uh, they, the herdsmen told it to the city. And then those people from the city, they came and they saw how the person that they knew was not in his right mind uh, and, uh, and that the demon possessed men had been healed. And so they told about it. And so then Jesus tells to the man who had been healed, he says, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming through the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. So here he received spiritual freedom and having these demons uh, removed from him. And yet the Lord of the spirits cares about our commitment to testify of our freedom. And he wants us to say, we, maybe you haven't been delivered from a demon. I don't know many you have, but we've been delivered from sin. We've been delivered from judgment. We've been delivered from evil. And we've been saved from judgment of sin. We've been saved from hell. We've been saved from the power of sin in our lives. And we are to declare it. We're, we're to be committed to tell others. So Jesus has the physical and the spiritual covered. Covered. Then we get in 
to a little more specific things here. Sickness. The Lord of health cares about our peace through faith. There, this is kind of a combined scene here because we have Jairus, who is the head of the synagogue, who has a 12-year-old daughter, and then in the midst of this crowd that Jesus is walking through to see him, there is a lady who had another 12-year-old situation, but it wasn't a 12-year-old daughter. It was a 12-year-old issue of bleeding. As Jesus went, verse 42, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, meaning her HMO and her PPO ran out, and she's paying out of pocket, and she's got nothing left, and there were no answers for 12 years, she could not be healed by anyone. So she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment. And immediately her discharge of blood ceased. I want you to note that this woman was not just suffering physically. Yes, 12 years of struggling with bleeding for a lady, that's, that's really, really rough. I can't imagine how tired one must be from the loss of iron and blood. And, uh, but on top of that, it was very typical for the crowd to be very judgy. And the, the, the idea back then is if, uh, if women couldn't have babies or if women had an issue like this, they must have been immoral. There must have been something that she did. And in the culture of judgment before a culture of help, that was, that was how Job's friends, so-called friends, approached Job and his tragedies. Oh, you must have done something wrong for you to deserve all this judgment by God. And that wasn't the case. God chose to, to test Job. Not because Job was an evil man. He was a righteous man. But they made that assumption because, you know, that's, that's what judge, judgmental people do. He was the opposite from Maria von Trapp from the Sound of Music, who somewhere between her youth and childhood, she must have done something good. You know, somewhere between his youth and childhood, he must have done something bad. And, and this lady with the issue of blood, somewhere between her youth and childhood, she must have done something bad. So, so here is that particular idea where she was not only physically desperate, she was emotionally desperate. And it talks about how she feared and trembled. And she didn't ask for an appointment with Jesus. She didn't have the prestige like Jairus to call for a meeting with Jesus. But as the crowd pressed around, she just reached out and touched his garment. Touched his garment. All I want to do is just touch him. And it says, as she touched the fringe of his garment, immediately the discharge of blood ceased. Then Jesus said, who was it who touched me? And everybody, uh, not me, not me, you know, my hands are clean. You know, I, I sanitized it. All denied it. And Peter said, Master, the crowd surrounds you and are pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. Now, please note, Jesus doesn't lose power because he's all power, all powerful, omnipotent, but he knows that there was power directed to the healing of this lady when she touched his garments. And when he asked the question, Who is it who touched me? It's not that he didn't know who, he was calling on her to, to talk, to appear to respond he knows exactly because he's also omniscient so he's omniscient and he's omnipotent but he asks and when the woman saw that she was no longer hidden because you know everybody kind of scooted away not me not me not me and they all kind of run away and she's kind of left standing there with the spotlight on her she came trembling because she feared and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people 
why she touched him. Here she is with candidness, openness, honesty. Yeah, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble physically. I'm destroyed mentally. I got nothing left. And what she had was the faith to reach out and touch him. Right now, you're spiritually beat up. You're physically sick. You have no energy. Four weeks of day camp can do that to you. Can you just lift up your arms and reach out to Jesus? She had enough faith to reach out to ask for help. And what did Jesus say? Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The God who can heal, the great physician is concerned about her faith. You see, in all of these miracles, it was about faith and proclamation, telling about it, believing that Christ can do that. And the reason why Paul had to deal with the thorn in the flesh that he asked three times to have it removed from him in 2 Corinthians 12, and God said, no, you're going to have that affliction for the rest of your life. Paul said, well, God is doing that to humble me. Also, so that I would find his grace sufficient and that in my weakness, his strength would be perfected in my weakness. And so he overcomes the issue of health. Then we come to Jairus' daughter. Jairus now is a prominent man. He is the ruler of the synagogue. He conducts the worship services, the feasts, the holidays. He is one who, you know, every... Uh, Jewish mother said, why can't you be like that man, you know, here, you know, he's, you know, he's leading, he's leading the Jewish faith. So Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, they were all waiting for him, on verse 40, went back a little bit. And there came a man, Jairus, who was ruler of the synagogue, and he fell at Jesus' feet, and he implored him to come to his house. Now, we have a, a, a contrast here of a lady with 12 years of an issue, and a prominent man with a 12-year-old daughter. And yet each were desperate. He falls at the feet of Jesus, begs him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years old, and she was dying. Jumping over to verse 49. While he was speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Don't bother Jesus, the teacher, anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him and says, Do not fear, only believe, and she would be made well. Don't fear, again. Don't fear. Believe. Don't fear the storm. Where's your faith? Don't fear, only believe, and she will be well. So he goes to the house. He didn't have he didn't allow anybody else to enter with him except Peter, John, James, the father and the mother of the child. All were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. And so the crowd around them was all saying, don't bother Jesus, she's dead. He can't heal her, she's already gone. And the grief of the parents it was just like getting hit by a steam truck. A 12-year-old daughter that they love and raise. But Jesus says, do not weep. She's not dead. She's sleeping. They laughed, but taking her by the hand, he called and saying, child, arise. Her spirit returned. She got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. I like that. That's the first thing that happened. was <laughs> eat. And her parents were amazed. But this is what's, what's interesting, is that Jesus said here, and I, I have it on the screen, but verse 56, but he charged them to tell no one what happened. So before, right, with the demoniac, go tell them. You know? and, uh, uh, and they told, and they told, and they told. But here, he says, don't tell anyone. Why? Because he knows the hearts. And I think in the second chapter of John, after Jesus does this miracle, or Jesus preaches, he says he knew, knows the heart of all men, and he departed and didn't preach the gospel to them because he knew the heart weren't caring or ready. By the very fact that they were mocking Jesus, 
uh, and laughing at him that he couldn't distinguish the difference between someone who's asleep versus someone who's dead when the Lord knows all these things because he's got mastery over everything. He knew that their heart wasn't ready. So he just, don't waste your breath on these guys. But here, Jairus, who is prominent versus the woman with the issue of uh, blood who we don't know her name and was not socially prominent, death is no respecters. Death is no respect of a person. It can come. And it is a painful thing to deal with the death of a child. I have a, I have a friend by the name of uh, Dave Deeks. There's a little picture of us. We went to Reds game together, and he's in the, the orange in the corner right above my head. See Daisy over there, and we all squished in this elevator. I thought it was a funny picture. But uh, at our IFCA convention, everybody got uh, this book that he wrote. It's called When, when Men Have Miscarriages. Now, I had already read it because I bought the Kindle version, and he's my friend. So, so I already had the Kindle version. But it was, it was great to get this. And, uh, uh, and you know, he, he, he writes in this. Uh, the reason why he writes to men is because men will process it differently than women. Ladies will carry the baby uh, bond with it in a, in a special way. The loss is painful in, in a different way. Um, you know, they'll have the baby parties and all these types of things. And, and the guy just doesn't get it. And so, so this, this book I thought was really, really important to help guys who have no clue to understand what grief is. He writes that death is difficult to deal with no matter who has died. Death crashes the party like an uninvited guest and causes more issues than could have ever been thought of. Death is expected by all, but is anticipated by none. I wrote Dave, and I thanked him for giving us this book because it was timely for our family. We got a phone call. Oh, we got a text, a family text from Karina. It says, uh, you know, hey, we need you on a family call. It says, I've got some bad news. So the, the call comes during day camp skits. So, you know, I'm there filming the skits, you know, and, and doing all that. And then I, I, I see the call come across, and it's a conference call that we, that we have with our family. So I go into the office, and she shares the news that. Uh, she had miscarriage. Jordan had come back from church to, to sit by her side, and she shared that news with us. And there was a bomb. Many of you have shared your experiences with us because you've gone through it, having lost a child. But no one's ever prepared for it. It was... Uh, Dave texted me this morning. He didn't know I was going to talk about this today. And he says, you know, I'm praying for you and for Karina and Jordan and Daisy. And, and uh, you know, it, it, just, it strikes and it hits you. You're in first service singing because he lives. Let me get to that verse. How sweet to hold a newborn baby. To know that the one grandchild I wouldn't get to hold. Later, I crying all day on Tuesday. And I look over the closing session and see 100 beautiful kids. Thinking, boy, it would have been great to have had a, a grandkid go through day camp. Maybe another one. But right now, this grandchild knows Jesus better than I do. I believe that Babies are in the presence of, of God when they die early and have a full realization of who Christ is, fuller than we have. A, a maturity that is complete, that we have not yet attained. And that's my hope. I wrote Dave and I just said, well, my grandbaby knows Jesus better than I do. And he says, that's beautiful and devastating all at the same time. And that's what we go through. 
And yet, it's because Christ died on the cross that a baby can be saved or that we who believe and place our faith in what Jesus accomplished on the cross could be saved. And so there's that hope. And for Jairus, for Jairus' uh, daughter, she, she was made alive, just like Lazarus was made alive, as beautifully depicted by the day camp scan. It's because Christ has that power. Because he is the Lord over death. He is the Lord over life. He is the Lord over nature. He is the Lord over the spiritual. He has it all covered so that when we encounter despair, demons, disease, or death, Christ is in absolute control. All we need to do is reach out and touch, proverbially speaking. Secondly, you're never too overwhelmed or have gone too far spiritually or you're too insignificant or too sad to be out of Jesus' compassion. Jesus not only has control, but also note his compassion in this text. He also cares about our, our heart. So I invite you to place your faith in the Lord over everything and everyone. He even saves us from sin and judgment. Would you trust Christ as your Savior? Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you that your Son is Lord over all. He is Lord over nature, and the supernatural is not difficult for him to achieve when he can speak a word and create a universe, hold out his hand and calm a storm, raise a child from a dead, from dead, or to remove thousands of demons out of an individual because he has all power, all control. And yet because of his compassion, you love us. You care about every need that we have and you have it covered. Thank you for covering it. Thank you for loving us too because of what Christ did on the cross. It's in his name. faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness who walk by faith and not by by faith our fathers roamed the earth with the power of his promise in their hearts of the holy city built by god's own hand a place where peace and justice reign we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on Him, our souls reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done, we'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith the prophets saw the day When the longed for Messiah would appear With 
the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave by faith the church was called to go in the power of the spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach to the dears in every corner of the earth would you stand we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him, our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. By faith, the mountain shall be moved. And the power of the gospel shall prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who called upon his name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward, till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. You may all be seated. Pastor Kevin. Thank you, worship team. We had a we had a wonderful last four weeks, and on Friday, it, it, it concluded our four-week day camp. Our theme was Kingdom Living, and so we kind of had a medieval, kind of royal kind of theme, and, and we had such a great time with, uh, with all the kids who came. Uh, we had um, about 110 kids come on a part-time, full-time basis, and we just want to thank all the parents for coming and signing up the kids and entrusting us with your children. I, I, did, I do want to just let you know that a, a lot of the funds um, that were raised uh, in the day camp fees, they go towards um, our, our staff. And they, they worked very hard for the number of weeks they signed up and they got a prorated scholarship to their, to their youth camp. And so um, in two weeks, there's a middle school camp Three weeks, there's a high school camp, and uh, and so a lot of our uh, staffers are going to camp because of of the the funds that were raised. So thank you for sending your kids there. Um, first off, I want to thank our staff. Um, they work really really hard. Uh, we had over 40 different different individuals help us in some way, from teaching to uh, uh, driving, uh, leading workshops. Um, helping us just get organized. And so if you helped out at day camp, would you just stand up? Would you just stand up? Drivers and workshop teachers and staff members. Thank you so very much for your ministry. They, our staff did such an awesome job. They worked really, really hard. And a lot of times we didn't have to tell them what to do. They jumped into action, moved tables, moving chairs, helping kids, watching for safety all those kind of things, and, and uh, what, a, what a blessing it was to see everyone in action. Um, I, I particularly want to thank our head teachers. Our head teachers are in charge of our classrooms, and they help organize our staff and all the kids, 
uh, and just make sure that everyone's doing well in the classroom. And so for our primary class, that was Callie and Haley. And if I call you, can you stand and just remain, just stand for a bit? For our middlers, it was Eva, Eva, Lee. For our, for our juniors, our fifth and sixth grade, Jenny Ko, Jenny Lee. And for our seventh graders, it's Lynette Hum. So thank you very much for all of your work. I know Lynette's around somewhere. Um, and, and then also I want to thank our directors. So months before day camp start, started uh, and began, they were in planning. And we had uh, eight uh, high school, well, and one college, seven and one, seven, seven high school, one college guy come and be our assistant directors. So there are young directors and they did so much in keeping camp running. And so I, I just want to recognize um, Callie and Haley, Momo and Kaylin, Jocelyn and, and Christy, Sam and Nick, and then Mr. Randy and Mrs. Evelyn, our directors. And we couldn't have day camp without them. So thank you so very much, everyone. They're, everyone's been such a blessing. Um, of course, we couldn't have day camp without the kids. And so we want to thank all the kids for coming. And so uh, this is Bible Sunday. And traditionally, we, we, would, we would give and present Bibles to those who didn't have a Bible. And everybody, except one person, had a Bible. And so we want to present this Bible to Leo Wong. And so Leo, come on up for, a, for your Bible. And Leo's name is written in there, presented to Fellowship Bible Church. And he can bring his Bible every, every Sunday, or he can, and he can read it at home. And so praise the Lord for Leo uh, desiring God's word. And we're going we're gonna to ask all the other kids to come on up at day camp. And so if you were a child, uh, a camper, come on up. And we have, uh, we have some bubble uh, makers for you and some bubbles or a Frisbee. So you can have a choice, either one or the other. And so uh, Mr. Randy, Mrs. Evelyn is going to pass out these things uh, to you guys. So come on up. Come on up. And then we're going we're gonna to stay up here. So go, go make a line over there with uh, Mrs. Evelyn, Mr. Randy. Grab one of those things. All our day camp uh, kids. So thank you for thank you for uh, sending your children. We had a fabulous time. Uh, the the Lord was very good, just helping um, helping uh, the kids to understand God's word, to hear the gospel message. Uh, some made decisions to accept Christ as Savior. Praise the Lord for that. And so um, we're 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 just so thrilled to have each and every one of them a part of our day camp. Um, Thank you, as Mr. Randy, Mrs. Evelyn is passing it, passing these things out. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for the kids, okay? And because they put in so much effort and so much work. If you didn't know, there was a contest board in the fellowship hall. It went up to thirty thousand points, and the, and you can get the best way to get all those points was just to memorize God's word. And so a lot of these kids memorized uh, uh, thirteen, fourteen verses. And then uh, in week four, you get bonus points if you recite all the verses. And so a lot of them engrafted God's word on a long-term basis in their hearts. And so uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for uh, all that they learned and how God's word ha has been kept in their hearts. And so thank you, everybody, for being a big part of day camp. And so um, uh, I know Izzy was in first service. Come on up, Izzy, for the picture, too. Okay, any other first Service folks, okay, we're gonna pray for the kids. Okay, let's bow in prayer. We're gonna pray, guys. Lord, we thank you for each and every one of our day camp kids who came, not just the representative here, but the 110 who came. And we thank you, Lord, for many who never heard the gospel, that they can hear the good news of how Christ came and, and died for them and loved them so much that he wants to have a relationship with them in heaven and so and here on earth. And so we thank you for that. 
Uh, Lord, we pray for the verses that have been memorized and the passages that have been learned and that you'll continue to speak in the, in the lives of these kids. Lord, so very precious they are. And I pray they'll continue to love the things of God, the word of God. And Lord, um, and they will, they will make that decision to accept Christ as Savior in the right time. And so we thank you and we praise you for all that has taken place. Thank you for our staff who serve so uh, sacrificially and so lovingly. And, we, and we, give you, we give you all the praise and glory. And we want to glorify you in all, all of this, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Let's give the kids a great big hand. Okay. Well, day camp has ended, but for some of our staff members, um, the journey continues because next week uh, there's a handful of us that will be going to El Cajon for a mission trip. And so I'm going to ask our team to come on up, and that's Matthew and uh, Momo, uh, Gavin, Nicholas, uh, Galen, uh, John Garcia, and so and myself, and we're going to be headed off 6.30 tomorrow morning uh, to El Cajon, and so we're going to partner with the church uh, down there and the Reed family, um, and this church particularly ministers to the Muslim refugees down in El Cajon. Uh, El Cajon is one of the refugee hubs of the nation, and so there's a lot of there's a big refugee population that comes there. And the pastor of the church that we're partnering with, Pastor McCrom, he got saved. Uh, he's a he himself is, uh, immigrated from Jordan, and he got saved here in the United States. And he has such a big burden to share the gospel with the Muslim population there. And so. Uh, this is our team. We're going to go down and we're, we're going to focus this year on youth ministry. Last year, we had a child, uh, children's and a, a youth program. And out of the youth program came a, a regular Bible club that started. And so the Reeds led uh, this Bible club uh, throughout the year. And so we're going to go down, see some of the same kids, but, but also uh, minister to a lot of the new kids. And we want to encourage this fellowship to keep growing and, and these kids to come out to church. And so uh, pray for us. That's what we really need. We want to thank uh, the church family and everyone who really gave financially. We, we have our full coverage uh, of support. And so we really covet your prayers. The last two mission trips down to El Cajon, there's been some health issues that, that popped up, including COVID uh, last year. But um, this year, we're really asking for uh, a lot of prayer for us, especially for our health, that we can uh, keep uh, serving the Lord faithfully. These guys have uh, served uh, at day camp. Uh, most of the folks here have served at day camp for a lot of, a lot of weeks. And so I know they're tired. And so we want to ask the Lord for his uh, guidance and blessing. So I'm going to ask Pastor Steve to come and pray for us. I also ask for your prayers, too, as uh, I leave on a, a mission sort of a trip uh, tomorrow morning at 3.30 in the morning. And so I'm going to South Carolina where we're going to be uh, having about 20 new missionaries join biblicalministries.org. And so we're, we're really excited about, about that. So pray. Uh, as you as you pray for missionaries during the week and pray for them, uh, we cover your prayers with our new missionaries as well. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this faithful team, many of them coming off for uh, long weeks of day camp. Uh, but Father, thank you that you are the one who will give them spiritual power to do spiritual work. Father, we pray that you will help them to overcome their fatigue. And, uh, and Father, that... Uh, uh, the the ministry being there with uh, uh, new youth and uh, and being excited that the gospel is going to go forward, Father will energize them. Father, we pray that they will be dependent on the Spirit of God for them to be effective witnesses and teachers of the Word. We pray that you will give them good health. We pray that you will guard them from any types of uh, infections or COVID or or flus or colds and. And so we, we pray that uh, this will not be an issue. But Father, if it is, as it has been in years past, may they find your grace sufficient. Father, we pray for safety as they travel, for unity as they spend a, a week together, 
And so, Father, we pray that uh, the fruit of the Spirit will reign uh, over their demeanor as uh, they are Spirit-filled. Father, we pray that uh, there will be children and youth and parents and adults who will come to Christ as a result of their gospel ministry. And so, Father, we want to commit them to you, and we rejoice uh, in, uh, in what you're going to do in hearing the report next week about uh, their wonderful ministry. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Thank you, team. Thank you for your patience. We're going to have just a few announcements before we dismiss you folks. The first announcement is uh, at 12 noon today, we have a membership class. And uh, if you are interested just in finding out about the church, you can come and it, it doesn't mean that you become a member or you're not committing yourself or signing your life away in any way by coming to the class. But come and find out about Fellowship Bible Church. You can ask questions about what we believe or uh, some of our procedures or what different ministries are available. And so lunch is provided. It's at 12 o'clock. There is uh, a sign up uh, um, link that had that had been available. But e even if uh, you didn't sign up, you can come and attend and join this group. The second announcement that we have uh, is that we have a, uh, that's, I think our, that's our last uh, one. Oh, a new class, The Reason for God. We just finished Chip Ingram's series on culture shock. That was a really great study. And we are going to start next week on this, this, uh, this six part series at nine o'clock on Sundays. And so come for our, our adult class. It's The Reason for God. And it's by uh, Pastor Tim Keller, who recently passed away. And so uh, come and join us nine o'clock on, um, on, on Sundays, Sunday mornings for this class. Um, our church picnic is, uh, is being planned now. And so we invited our day camp families. You can invite your neighbors and your loved ones and your families to come to our picnic. It's just a great time of just getting to know uh, different members of our church family and different people. Um, and it is, uh, it was, it's planned for Saturday, August 12th over at the Bayside Park. And it's not at Booth Bay in Foster City. It's at Bayside Park in San Mateo. And so, uh, come and join. If you can RSVP, it, it helps those who are planning the food. And we always have a lot of food. And so come join us for the picnic. There'll be softball. There'll be, um, I'm sure volleyball and some other sports available. And so um, join us for this. Our um, fourth announcement is uh, our cancer support group is meeting today, 2 p.m. And so if you are interested in joining, encouraging one another, praying for one another because of, of cancer or helping people with cancer, uh, it's on Zoom. The meeting's on Zoom 1, 2 p.m. And so you can go online and join our group over here. Thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for thank you for this uh, great day that you have given to us. Thank you that we can come and we can worship you. And Lord, we want to give you all the praise and glory for everything that that takes place, even even the difficult things in our lives. And so, Lord, as we go forth, may you use us to be your messengers of the great gospel message. And uh, Lord, may we may we live uh, rightfully before you this week. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a, have a great week, everyone.